For gardeners who like to attract hummingbirds, the number one goal in the spring is to lure them into your garden as early and often as possible. Hello, my name is Stephen Barr, and in this video, I will present some of the premier nectar-rich spring bloomers that are terrific for attracting hummingbirds. And I will walk you through a few other tips and tricks to ensure the hummingbirds find your garden during migration and stick around all season. So let's get started. Unlike most other bird species, the hummingbirds that breed in North America migrate during the daylight hours and are visually on the lookout for resources below as they fly. So by providing nectar feeders and early spring bloomers starting around the month of April for most gardeners, your chances of luring them into your yard are likely very high. If you're a little new to gardening and don't have many spring bloomers, have no fear. There's always a quick fix in instant nursery nectar. We're going shopping. And it's those family run mom and pop type nurseries and even farmers markets that you really want to target. And they will absolutely have a better variety and more knowledgeable staff than the mega chain and retail stores. And their prices will likely be more reasonable. Petunias, they're all over the place in garden centers. They're native to the tropical regions of the Americas and their trumpet-shaped blooms have co-evolved with the hummingbird species in their range. Most garden centers have a great variety of these because of their popularity with humans, but the hummers love them too. And their showy blooms can be displayed prominently in full sun to lure in the hummingbirds. That first spring blitz of flowers on the market may also include tropicals like cupfia, mandevilla, and hibiscus. All are effective for drawing in hummingbirds. Garden center regulars like lantana and zinnia, which are great for all pollinators, including butterflies and bees, should be pretty easy to find as well. And I'm always on the lookout for the tender varieties of salvias and sages. These plants are nearly unrivaled in the amount of nectar they produce. There's usually new cultivars every year and they're often pretty affordable. A few other good choices for a sunny or part sun site would be spider flower, catnip, and the perennial bee balms. If you're looking for plants for a more shady location, there's usually plenty of colorful fuchsia varieties to choose from but the more tubular types seem to do better for attracting hummers. Be mindful that these garden center plants are all greenhouse grown and they may be a little cranky. They may need a little time to adjust to your particular climate and weather conditions. The trailing blue lobelias are also an excellent choice for hummingbirds. And common nursery plants such as impatiens, coral bells, and hostas may also attract them. Well, I sure hope you found what you're shopping for. In this next section, we will look at spring blooming hummingbird magnets. One of the earliest flowering perennial plants for hummingbirds is bleeding heart or dicentra. And these usually bloom in April to May for me. And these are native to Eastern Asia and have charming pillowy heart shaped blooms. You can sometimes find them in nurseries in colors ranging from red to pink to white. And the hummingbirds will come to draw nectar from these. The blooms on these can also perform a little trick called the lady in the bath display. To see the show, you must turn the bloom upside down and pull on the outer petals like so to reveal an old timey image of a lady wearing a ba bathing cap taking a bath. And that is the always entertaining lady in a bath trick. And here's a smaller related dicentra type native to the Pacific coast of North America called the Pacific Bleeding Heart. Another early hummingbird attractor and a real gardener's delight is the stunning lupin or wild blue lupin. And there's a wide array of cultivars for these, but they all exhibit a haystack of bright, bold colors and they're sort of reverse bloomers as the blooms start at the bottom and they work their way up the stalk. These are absolutely majestic flowers and the pride of many gardens. Lupins are actually a member of the pea family and are native to the entire northern hemisphere. So they're happiest in cooler climates and they prefer full sun and well-drained soil. 
This fuchsia and yellow example is a newer cultivar called Tequila Flame, and it's a giant with maybe 20 inch long, big fat blooms. It's one of my favorites. And here's another treasure from the pea family. This is Lupin's redneck cousin called Baptisia australis. These herbaceous perennials are hardy North American wildflowers that prefer similar growing conditions to the lupins. In particular, they really don't like to have their roots wet. In fact, uh, I've killed these before by trying to plant them in heavy clay soil. Otherwise, they're pretty easy to care for. And they can get fairly tall, typically three to four feet uh, fully grown. And they've got these strong, almost woody main stems that hold these wonderful P-shaped flowers. Many new cultivars are bicolored, and I'm showing a few examples here. These are a great garden addition and add a unique architectural interest to any perennial bed. I, I recommend these fabulous baptisias. Here is columbine. This North American wildflower is a spring staple for migrating ruby throats and a favorite for cottage style gardeners. In their species form, their unusual blooms display brilliant orange colored petals and sepals on the outside, paired with blazing yellow pistils and stamens on the inside. The rear end of the modified blooms have a long spur-like tube which holds sweet nectar for the pollinators. Horticulture has produced an astonishing variety of color combinations and flower shapes for these plants, and they're likely to cross-pollinate for you in your garden as well. When the seed pods ripen in the fall, they'll disperse and readily self-sow for you over winter. The blooms will last longer here if they're kept in dappled shade to full shade. Too much sun and they'll fry right out. Catmint is a hardy small flowering sage that looks great in mass plantings, but I would suggest keeping these in containers since their root system is very aggressive and can take over beds. They're perfectly happy in full sun without much maintenance. These are members of the Lamiaceae genus, and this is a, it's a very large group of plants with familiar names such as mint, sage, and salvia. Most are small flowering and aromatic, and most are really good for pollinators. Included in this group is Salvia nemorosa. This is a hardy compact sage that blooms early and can be deadheaded throughout the summer for continuous blooming. You can find these in different shades of purple, blue, and even white. I was pleasantly surprised when I first planted coral bells because of all the attention they received from the hummingbirds. These are fairly common shade plants that are usually grown for their foliage, but those unassuming little dangling blooms, they prove to hold plenty of nectar. The dramatic blooms on the hardy foxglove make them a gardener's favorite. They're known for their fabulous freckled or leopard print patterns. These are great for hummingbirds and bees, and they'll reseed naturally if grown in the right conditions. They're good for zones 4 through 10, and I found that they perform best in part shade. The gold standard for woody shade bushes has to be the azaleas. Azalea fans, raise your hands. This first example is the native Florida azalea, but don't let the name fool you. These are hardy from zones 6 through 9. The more species type forms display long spiny pistils that swoop out of the blooms to create an outrageous shape that looks somewhat like an underwater sea urchin creature. These species type azaleas are a little hard to find at local nurseries but can be found online or through quality mail order catalogs. And it's worth digging around to try to get them. They're really terrific plants. Another spectacular azalea is the fiery flame azalea. And these are native understory bushes in the Appalachian mountain range. And they typically come in bright orange and coral shades, which is a very alluring color to hummingbirds. Also, FYI, they are extremely attracted to big floppy orange hats, just so you know. You can find flame azaleas in more compact forms like this example, which is just maybe five years old. 
And here's the Klondike cultivar that shows handsome coppery foliage in the spring, changing to a deeper bronze color in the fall. You can light up any shady nook with a myriad of azalea color choices. The selections are just endless, and most cultivars are much showier than the ones I'm presenting in this video. And here's just one more I'd like to showcase, and it's the adorable pink shell azalea, which is also an American native from the southern Appalachian mountain range. And their feathery pink blooms are nature's version of cotton candy. These plants look fantastic in the shade. The next hummingbird-worthy bush is in the honeysuckle family, and it's called Wygela. Yes, it's pronounced Wygela, or Wygela. Okay, that was corny, but you probably will remember the pronunciation. So these are old-world bushes that you probably see used as foundation plants around town and in commercial zones. I once lived in a property that had this bush, and it must have been as old as a tortoise. But once it started blooming around May, the hummingbirds were on it. These grow comfortably from zones 4 through 8 and prefer full sun. Now let's look at a couple of early blooming hardy vines. This is the striking cross vine, which explodes with its first flush of blooms in the spring. It resembles trumpet vine, and it can get nearly as big, but it's manageable and trainable and has a hardiness up to zone 6. These come in several color combinations, and I'm showing the popular tangerine beauty on the screen. It's tough to find these in nurseries, but these are well worth mail ordering if you have the space to accommodate them. And here is Lonicera semper virens. This is the hardy native honeysuckle that I've raved about before, and I'll do it again, so pay attention to what I'm about to say. These will rain in hummingbirds. I repeat, these will rain in hummingbirds. Their first flush of blooms are perfectly timed for the spring arrival of migrating ruby throats. And they can be pruned back several times during the summer and they'll bloom for you straight up until frost. I'm showing two selections in these clips, the Alabama Crimson with solid coral blooms and a yellow throat, and the hybrid Gold Flame Honeysuckle, which is tricolored with coral white and a creamy yellow. The Gold Flame blooms can fan out to about five, maybe six inches across. I live on the edge of zone six and seven in central New Jersey, and the red buckeyes have to be the most effective spring blooming trees, other small trees in my area for attracting hummingbirds. Their impressive eight inch bloom clusters are held upright for any flying pollinators. These are hardy from zone six through nine, and they can grow up to maybe 25, 30 feet when fully mature. There's a handful of native North American buckeyes that grow much taller, which also attract hummingbirds. These include the Texas buckeye, the Ohio buckeye, and the yellow buckeye. These all have been known to hybridize with each other, and these are all really large shade trees. But for sheer size alone, the granddaddy of them all has to be the majestic tulip poplar. And if you've ever seen these freakish lime green and bright orange teacup shaped blooms, you'll appreciate their namesake. I planted this particular tree on the screen as a tiny seedling about 15 years ago at the local university, and it's turned into a 60-foot behemoth. I've nicknamed it Audrey II after the little shop of horrors plant character. Well, I had a lot of fun making this video. I hope this spring hummingbird content was helpful. If you like this video, please give it a like and consider subscribing. And I'll be sure to upload more gar gardening content soon. Thank you for joining me today. Be well, and I'll see you in the next video.